We'll be looking at another aspect of healthcare delivery on his up this morning. And of course, we're looking at the healthcare delivery strategic investment in medicine, in Medicare services. Strategic investment in Medicare services. And we'll be hooking up to Dr. Lars Odeze, is a public health consultant. Dr. Lars Odeze, good morning. Welcome to News Hub. Dr. Lars Odeze, are you there, please? All right, quickly, if you can hear me, let's look at possible investment said that has been made in uh, Medicare services in Nigeria. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Do Dr. Lazo Deze, good morning. Welcome to News Hub. Hello, good morning. Good to be with you. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be with you. Uh, nice to be with you, Dr. Lazo Deze. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. All right, then. Let's look at possible investment uh, that has been taken strategically in Medicare services in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, viewers. Yes, uh, there is a lot of investment that should be made as a least in the uh, Nigeria health sector and the which is the one that uh, we are more used to um, but there's also the preventive aspect of health so uh, and I, I, I want to commend you guys for bringing up this conversation you know, because in the last couple of weeks uh, we have new administrations in at the national level and the majority of the states and this is the time to really hit the ground running. And what are those investments that should be made? I think uh, there is urgent need to make our hospitals to begin to work. And who are those to make this happen? Of course, we know that uh, government has a huge role to play, especially at the state level. I emphasize this because many of the, many of the times we tend to focus a lot uh, at the federal, yes, at every level there are responsibilities. But in terms of making the hospitals to work, uh, the state governors have more investment to make. In terms of human resources, there's currently a huge crisis who, uh, in the human resources for health. Uh, health workers are leaving the country in droves. Uh, you know, some weeks ago, the Nigeria Association of National Association of Journalists and Midwives gave out data of thousands of persons. Uh, nurses who have left the country. Of course, uh, we are aware of that, that of doctors, but even radiographers, laboratory scientists, and among those who are in the country, there are also a good number who are leaving uh, the health uh, work and doing some other jobs uh, that they feel is uh, in a better position to fund them. So that's re really very critical, investing in human resources. Uh, that includes not just hiring uh, health workers at the primary health care level, general hospitals, but also uh, the training, because it's garbage in, garbage out. Medical education is very important. Uh, sometimes we complain about certain mistakes and certain errors that is done at the hospital level. We need to begin to look at the quality of medical education, schools of nursing, medical schools, schools of health technology. These days, uh, political actors just set up schools, uh, put up big buildings and commission them without providing the necessary equipment, necessary manpower that is required to impact uh, knowledge and skills that people need to do. So that's really very critical and important. And again, as we train them, we should also provide an enabling environment for them to do their job. Uh, it's not just about how much they are paid, which is uh, extremely important. But many persons also live because they suffer depression. They, they have situations where they get to lose patients that they are supposed to uh, save their lives just because they don't have what is needed uh, to save those lives. So, and diagnostic services, our laboratories, uh, our, you know, we need to invest, uh, to make env the environment very conducive for private investment. So now going uh, from government uh, to private. Uh, there are private investors. The health sector is a very huge industry, multi-billion dollars 
industry, but we are not taking good advantage of it. We have the numbers. Do you know that Nigeria is uh, the only country out of the 10 most populous countries in the world that is not producing its own vaccine? So we are purchasing vaccines from other countries. Just check out the capital flight. So when uh, over 70, 80% of the drugs and medical commodities we use in this country are imported, what about the equipment? Mostly imported. So if we begin to produce the consumables every day, health sector is a two four seven business. You know, so it's not just charity. We need to begin to see health as a business and treat it as such. You know, so for anything you get free, somebody is paying for it. So if there is enabling environment for the more than one hundred pharmaceutical industries in this country, you know, with the appropriate incentives to do their business, who are going to produce more. And when we produce more, you know, it's not only going to make commodities available at the appropriate time, but it's also bring more revenue to the government to now reinvest at least 15% of the budget out at the national and state level should be allocated to health and used to solve uh, as many problems as we have in the system. Interest. But I would like to ask, from your statement you said, there are two aspects that we need investment that's talking about the preventive and the curative. And you said we are used to the curative aspect of it. So please, can you throw more light on some strategic investments that should be made in the preventive aspect of Medicare uh, so that we reduce contraction as it were? So what possible investments should be made in the preventive aspects of Medicare, please? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Yes, a preventive aspect, uh, you know, uh, 2020, we had the COVID-19 pandemic. 2014, we had the Ebola pandemic. Of course, recently, there are reports of anthrax, cholera. We have it every year, meningitis every year. Lassa fever has been with us in the 70s. And these are highly preventable health conditions. You know, so we need to invest more in health security. What do you mean by health security? You know, having the infrastructure in place, uh, having the human capacities in place that will be doing surveillance. You know, we need to invest more on the environment. You know, there are social determinants of health. Uh, some of those social determinants of health are uh, issues related to education, girl-child education. You know, it's absolutely unacceptable for us to keep having child marriage with uh, you know, girls not uh, going to school. So if a, a, a woman has at least basic education up to secondary school level, it helps in the kind of decisions they make about their children. You know, we need to invest also in environmental management. Many of the health conditions we have, especially infectious diseases, and even the uh, non-communicable diseases, has to do with uh, the environmental factors. Whether it's last half is well, whether it's community, whether it's all these uh, wastes, poor management of waste makes all of us uh, vulnerable. So the interaction between man, animals, and the environment, you know, leads to zoonotic uh, diseases. So we have to invest in education, massive public awareness. There's a lot of disinformation and disinformation in the health system where uh, the professionals are not really allowed to even talk much about what they do or to so even advertise. But the quacks are advertising. You know, the quacks are seized uh, a lot of radio uh, stations or media platforms to advertise those things that are working and things that are not working. So these things are things that have uh, to be uh, regulated. We also need to invest in our people. One of the major determinants of health is, is the economy. So the more poverty you have, the more diseases you are likely going to have because people will not eat well. Nutrition is a, a major determinant. So when people are wealthier, when there are more jobs, you know, there will be people who will be in a better position to eat balanced diet. And uh, this is even more uh, pronounced among children. Protein energy malnutrition or severe acute malnutrition you know, lots of lack of certain elements that the children need to have that will help their brain to grow, you know, are some of the things that, you know, is even causing not only short term, but also long term implication. When you have children that are not uh, exclusively breastfed for six months due to the fact that 
uh, their parents had to go out and find something to eat. It affects their growth and development. And on the long time, uh, you know, the quality of their IQ could also be affected due to stunting. Nigeria has one of the highest cases of stunting uh, in the world. So all this all encompassing childhood nutrition, uh, proper environmental management, investing in health security, especially at the state level. During COVID-19 pandemic, we realized that many states do not have the personnel with the capacity to do case identification and surveillance. And these are things that the epidemiology units of the public health departments in every state you know, should be strengthened. At the local government level, the health educators, uh, waste management, all these functions of primary health care, working with communities, very important. Every community should have a health committee as you know, the National Health Act 2014, uh, Section 2 specified, and also detailed by the World Health Systems Policy of the National Primary Health Care Development Agency. So it's an all-encompassing thing because health speaks to the total, complete, you know, uh, physical, social, and uh, uh, psychological well-being of, of, of the person. So the treatment is just one part, but as we push for good governance and uh, improve the economy, uh, better environmental management. Generally, they are all speaking to, to uh, the, the health of the nation. All right, um, Dr. Laz, uh, thank you so much for that intervention. Um, yesterday, um, some private entities were at the presidential villa um, to speak with, uh, to interface with the president, and it had to do with the eradication of polio and other infectious diseases like measles and what have you. Uh, and the question for me has always been, uh, why don't we have so much private participation in, in, in health care, this strategic uh, investment in Medicare services? Because most times when we talk about this, it's always about government. I understand that government has, it plays a pivotal role in ensuring, uh, providing Medicare services. But then where do we leave uh, the private investors or those who invest in our communities and in our country at large? Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, you know the biggest investor, the biggest funder of our healthcare system, or even uh, Medicare as it's worth, is you and I. You know, close to 80% of healthcare expenditure in this country is out of pocket expenditure. So, Nigerians, ordinary Nigerians, those monies you pay to get tests conducted, you pay for services, and, uh, you know, you pay uh, at the pharmacy to buy drugs. Who together, we are the biggest funder, not even the government. You know, so ha having made that point, um, uh, private sector investment is very key, but as we all know, private sector is business. You know, so if we make the environment very conducive and there's more production, you know, uh, I, I, I talked with some uh, private sector uh, recently, and uh, they say that it's cheaper to import medications uh, you know, it's more profitable for them to import uh, drugs or commodity, medical commodities you know, than producing here because of so many uh, issues and economic factors that they're going through. So with that, they, they, they're not likely to be in a position to uh, you know, do what should be needed. So I'm really hopeful that the new administration should interact with uh, these key players, understand what their issues are, even at the state level, make the environment conducive so that they will invest more, you know, and access to funds is also uh, an issue. If you want to uh, get facility to build up, you know, it's actually much more difficult than getting facility to invest in other areas of the economy. Then health insurance is something that is key, and this is an area that uh, everybody has a role to play, but the government still has the biggest role to play. Uh, thankfully, uh, the Ninth uh, Assembly uh, passed the National Health Insurance Authority Act 2022, uh, which was affected, and I think section 14 of it makes health insurance mandatory. So, and it's also created for the Vulnerable Persons Fund. Vulnerable Persons Fund are people who are living below poverty line, over 103 million Nigerians, uh, you know, are living in multi-dimensional poverty. And uh, people who are jobless, you know, over 40% uh, uh, unemployment rate, 
close to 60% are among young people. Then uh, we, we also talk about elderly people, children under five years, and persons with disability. These are people who economically or financially we could consider as being vulnerable. I will not be able to do uh, out of pocket expenditure for quality health care. So this government, uh, both at the state and national level, should, as a matter of urgency, uh, begin to make funds available, you know, for the vulnerable persons funds to expand the health insurance coverage to have more Nigerians covered. What is it going to do when there is uh, expansion of health insurance coverage? It's going to encourage more private investment in the medical care sector because right now what we have is you have people who assess money, build uh, very big hospitals, spend a lot of money. As a private investor in, in Medicare, you are not allowed to advertise. But hospitals in India and other countries will be advertising in Nigeria. And Nigerians who have money to pay will be traveling out of the country to access those care. Not knowing that you could get those services in Lagos, in Port Harcourt, in Enugu, in Abuja, with some very good private health facilities. So we need to look at some of these our uh, legislation that discourages private, uh, you know, health players from even talking about, uh, you know, the services they have available, you know, to promote it. Meanwhile, foreign hospitals and health institutions are promoting theirs here, and those who have money to pay. So when there is ins uh, higher insurance uh, coverage, when we expand it, it will make those who own hospitals to know that at least majority of our population we will be able to afford quality health care. Not now that many people are struggling to feed. So that's why they are seeking all kinds of miracles when they are sick, when there are medical solutions to those kind of illness. All right, uh, Dr. Lars, it's a good thing you mentioned insurance policies. Um, I particularly just want to draw your attention to the N NHIS, for instance. Um, I was surprised um, to discover that discovered this a, a, some, some weeks back. Uh, my mom is over 70, over 60, I beg your pardon. And what she told me was that uh, she is to be taken off the NHIS. And I was wondering, I mean, why would you take somebody who is obviously getting into that stage of their lives where they need even more medical care, better medical care of an insurance policy such as that? So that left me baffled. So how about the aged? We're not deliberate about that. Isn't that a concern as well? The aged in our society accessing uh, good medical care. We're not deliberate about that. Isn't that a concern for you? Absolutely. It's a, it's a concern for me and it should be a concern for everyone. Uh, the aged, and I find it at old age that we even have more health needs because that's a period that the body cells are getting weaker. That's a period that non communicable diseases are usually more prevalent where you have more cases of cancer, you have uh, more cases of heart disease and some other health conditions. So yes, the elderly people deserve health insurance coverage. The design of NHIS as it were uh, when it started in 2005 when the patient started does not quite accommodate you know, the end of life care or having it uh, ad infinitum. But as it is with the National Health Insurance Authority as it's now national uh, NHIA, uh, that's a new name now, you know, so covers everybody, universal health coverage. And I really want Nigerians to get to know more uh, about this. And let's begin to make these demands because uh, what we tend to demand more is also what our political actors tend to give us more. So let's begin to ask this question. Uh, the vulnerable persons funds, uh, I think, should cover elderly people. So because they are not earning money. There's also this National Senior Citizens Act. You know that has the health components that has certain provisions so every state now has a health insurance agency so it's not just a national thing when it comes to health and all the tiers of government has those to play so let's begin to ask our governors what package do they have for elderly people you know so how do we cover those populations already the basic health care provision fund as provided by national health at session 11 already made not less than one person of the consolidated revenue fund available uh, for health uh, insurance, 50% uh, of the basic health care provision fund goes for health insurance, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. So there is need for more funding, both uh, government at various levels, states, 
local government, even individuals, philanthropists. There are a lot of Nigerians who are very rich, you know, who can say in my community, uh, work with the state family health care agency, okay, I want to provide health insurance for 1,000 persons. Uh, a number of states have this package that you can pay 12,000 naira per annum, you know, and they have what is called the adoption method. I think Anambra State is using it, Imo State is using it, and some other states are also deploying this, where as an individual you can decide that you want to uh, pay insurance for, say, 500 or 100 or 50 elderly people as a way of giving support or giving back to the society. So that's where even individuals could come in, in in providing this support in addition to uh, whatever government uh, will have to do. So at the state level, let them be those packages. And very importantly, let us have hospitals. It's not just enough uh, paying this money for insurance. But if the services are not available, if our hospitals are not working, if our health workers are not well motivated you know, to stay, you will hire 10 today. In six months' time, nine out of 10 had left. Is not uh, quite sustainable. So we must be very holistic in tackling all these challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Daisy, for your contributions. But before we let you go, please, uh, successive governments have invested in primary health care delivery, yet to no avail. And this is because of the misconceptions people have had in where they go to when they have a particular ailment. As, as small as malaria, people are going to the tertiary institutions. Of course, we have the primary, secondary, and the tertiary institutions of healthcare services. Please explain to us at what point in time in the situation of our health that we visit which primary, secondary, and healthcare delivery? I mean, in tertiary healthcare delivery. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the design of the health uh, care delivery system is uh, you have primary healthcare, which if fully functional, should be able to take care of over 80% of our health needs, whether it's preventive, curative, or palliative, if fully functional, then uh, from primary health care, we should be the first point of call when we have any health condition, you know. When, uh, Sorry about that. There's another language you use that I think is alien to our viewers. Sorry, Dr. Deze. You said <laughs> preventive, yes. curative, yes. and palliative. You've explained preventive and curative, but please let's get to know what the palliative is all about as you continue. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, a palliative care uh, occurs in situations where uh, for certain health conditions you can't really cure or complete, completely you know, bring the person back to normal, what it used to be. But it's, it's kind of supportive care. For instance, uh, if someone has stroke, and the person has been treated in the hospital and, uh, you know, discharged, you may not have a complete return of the movement of certain parts of the body, but you still need uh, some kind of care, physiotherapy, you know, people to be moving the part of the body so that it doesn't uh, get too stiff and, and things like that. You know, so at, at, at that level, follow-up is, is, is an example of uh, palliative care. People who are not mobile, you know, and uh, they need some kind of support. You know, at, at the primary health care level, you could have the nurses, the choose, who can even be doing home visits. Uh, the design of primary health care is in a way that it runs two, four, seven. And there are three different kind of facilities in primary health care. You have the health post. Health post serves uh, 500 to 2,000 population. It doesn't need to be open for 24 hours. It should be open for say, 8 to 12 hours, depending on how the community can sustain it. So you have the health health clinic. The health clinic, you know, uh, serves two to 5,000 population. And it could be open to maybe 12 hours or a, a bit longer than that, and have up to like six staff, uh, in total, six to eight staff. But you now have the PHC, the primary health care center. The, the primary health care center should be open 247, and it should be residential. You must have the officer in charge and some of them who are living there, you know. And according to the World Minimum Health Care Package or the World Health System Policy, you should have not less than 17 staff. And these 17 staff are not going to be working at the same time. They are on shift. You have those who work in the daytime. You have those who work at the night. And by 17 staff, 
I mean technical staff that will include uh, community health officer, include at least three, four nurses and midwives, include uh, community health extension workers, uh, co uh, junior community health extension workers, pharmacy technician, health records officer, you know, account officers, security personnel. You know, if you put both the clinical and non-clinical staff, you'll be getting up to 24 persons or 25 persons that should be working in primary health care. If you have a medical doctor that comes, fantastic, but it's not compulsory to have a full-time medical doctor in a primary health care facility. So, but how many of our primary health care facilities have this? That's part of the problem. If you have a side lab, they perform certain tests. They should have uh, dental care. They should have eye care. You know, at the basic level, preventive and being able to diagnose some very common uh, health conditions. It is because many of our primary health care facilities are not fully functional. You know, people don't know if you go to a PAC and you meet an empty space, or they tell you the person there has gone to the market or has gone for school runs because you have only two health workers working there. There's no kind of amount to pay two health workers that will make them to be working for 24 hours. It's not possible. So that's why we say it's not just about the money that are being paid. It's also about having them in the right numbers. And again, for our primary health care to work, our committees must be involved. We usually take this for granted. All right, One Dr. of the ben. key challenges of our primary health care is the lack of right, Dr. committee Lass. governance structure. Every committee should have a health committee, and they all have responsibilities to play. It's when this is happening, our PAC will right. begin to work, and people will begin to utilize it better. Thank you so much, Dr. Lars. I mean, it almost feels as though one is in a lecture theater, I mean, a lecture room with you <laughs> while you speak. I mean, the ease at which uh, you're just spewing this out is simply amazing. I, we just hope that um, our policymakers, and now that we have a new government in place, we just hope that they take some of these things uh, seriously so that indeed Nigerians will heave a sigh of relief, uh, a sigh of relief as far as uh, quality Medicare is concerned. Thank you so much, Doc Dr. Lars Eze, for coming on the program uh, this morning to discuss a strategic investment in Medicare services. I hope we'll get to have you some other time.